we're going to talk about software testing and verification. In this talk, we'll discuss why software testing is important. We'll establish the different types of testing so that we can have intelligent conversations about tests. We'll discuss some best practices for testing and verification. We'll discuss how to uh, adapt what we're talking about to your specific project needs. And then we'll close out by talking about how real Department of Energy code gets tested. The benefits of testing are that it provides high quality software that delivers correct results and improves confidence. Mike talked about this a little bit in his reproducibility talk. It also increases the quality and speed of development, reducing development and maintenance costs. Uh, this is what Mike was talking about with the technical debt. If you don't do software testing, you are incurring technical debt. People frequently view uh, testing as a tax that has to be paid. You have to do this thing so that you can um, do useful work. And like any other tax, if you don't pay the tax, then really, really bad things happen. So it's better to pay the tax than it is to have to deal with the penalty later. Testing can help you maintain portability to a variety of systems and compilers. For instance, I personally run on a Red Hat 6 machine. I test uh, my code on a Red Hat 6 machine. So if something is going to break on, I don't know, um, a Mac, I'm not going to necessarily notice that unless I set up automatic testing on a machine that's not like mine. It also helps in refactoring your code because you avoid introducing new errors when you're adding new features, and it also helps you to avoid reintroducing old errors. How common are bugs? This is important to talk about because all of us, we, we like to think that we write bug-free code. My code is perfect. I don't have to worry about bugs. I'm sure all of your code is also perfect. Nobody here ever writes buggy software. But that's just not true. Programs don't acquire bugs like people acquire germs by hanging out with buggy programs, although that would be pretty cool if they did. Programmers have to insert them. Uh, so if we look at the bugs per thousand lines of code in various software, then the industry average for delivered software, for finished software, is anywhere between one and 25 errors per thousand lines of code. And in the Microsoft Applications Division, they have anywhere between 10 to 20 defects during the in-house testing per 1,000 lines of code. And then in the release product, product, they have about one bug per 2,000 lines of code. So if you've ever used a Microsoft product, you have probably run into a bug at some point. Imag no, I, I know, we're, we're just <laughs> pretending here. <laughs> we're using our imaginations. You have run into one of those one bugs out of 2,000 lines of code. Imagine if there were no in-house testing, if you were running into 10 to 20 defects within your uh, 1,000 lines of code instead of one per 2,000. That code would be completely unusable. So we're going to look at three case studies now about why software testing is important. The first one is the protein structures of Dr. Jeffrey Chang. Dr. Jeffrey Chang was a scientist who was working on generating protein structures. And he inherited some code that uh, flipped two columns of data, inverting an electron density map. This resulted in generating incorrect protein structures. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he had already published his work by the time he discovered the bug in the software, and he ended up having to retract three, five publications, which was responsible on his part. He recognized the error, and he retracted five publications voluntarily. But it's still not a position that any of us ever want to be in. Having to retract something is like my worst nightmare, and he had to go through that five times. So obviously this was damaging to his reputation, this bug, but it was also impactful to the community as a whole because one of those publications that he ended up having to retract was cited 364 times. 364 other papers were based on this incorrect work. And additionally, there were many papers and grant applications that uh, got rejected because they conflicted with his results. They were correct, but they got rejected because they conflicted with results that were assumed to be correct. So we've learned now how software, um, how if you don't test your software, you can run into uh, damage to your reputation, damage to the community as a whole. We're going to talk about financial damage now with the Ariane 5. The Ariane 5 was a European orbital launch vehicle that was meant to launch 20 tons into low Earth orbit, orbit. And you'll note that I say it was meant to launch 20 tons into low Earth orbit. It was not very successful. The initial rocket went off course, and then it started to disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere it self-destructed less than a minute after its initial launch. Why did this happen? There were seven variables at risk of leading to an operand error because they were converting floating point numbers to integers. Four of them were protected by assertions and the other three were not. And one of those three variables was the, the cause of this accident. Thus, 
the ensuing investigation concluded that insufficient test coverage was one of the causes for this accident, and it resulted in a loss of almost 400 million US dollars. So it was a very, very expensive bug. The last one that we'll talk about, we're gonna escalate a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about how computer bugs, how software bugs can kill people. The Therac 25 was a computer controlled radiation therapy machine that had minimal software testing. And if there was ever a thing that you would want to have really extensive good software testing, it would probably be something with the name radiation in its title, but it had minimal software testing. So there was a race condition in the code that went completely undetected meaning that unlucky patients were struck with approximately 100 times the intended dose of radiation. They were supposed to get anywhere between 100 and 200 rads. They got 15,000 rads. Uh, so those of you, I see some people shaking their heads because you know about physics. Um, you might be thinking at this point that that sounds like enough to kill a person. And you would be entirely correct because this machine ended up um, being recalled after six accidents that resulted in death and serious injuries. What do I mean by serious injuries? There was one woman being treated with this machine. She had ovarian cancer and the radiation did so much damage to her body that she ended up having to have a hip replacement because the, the machine just destroyed her hips. So we've now learned that software testing is really important and we're going to learn vocabulary so that we can speak intelligently about software testing. We can describe uh, tests by their granularity, meaning how much code do they execute? The finest granularity of test is a unit test, which uh, tests individual functions or classes. They're meant to build and run fast because of how little code they actually execute. They are also meant to localize errors. Uh, they're usually written before or during code development, which prevents faults from being introduced. And an example of a unit test is, let's say you have a vector class and you wanna see whether you can correctly compute a dot product. That would be a unit test. But the moral of the unit test is if a unit test fails, you should know exactly what is broken. You should be able to narrow it down to a particular function, to a particular class. Um, you know exactly what you should investigate if one of the tests starts to fail. Integration tests are at a higher granularity. They test the interaction of larger pieces of software and they don't build and run as fast as unit tests. An example of this is maybe you have a preconditioner class and you already have unit tests for your preconditioner class to see whether applying it to a vector produces the correct result. You already have a Krelov solver class, you have um, unit tests to see if the Krelov solvers perform correctly, but you want to see if the preconditioner class works with your Krelov solver class. That would be an integration test. System level tests execute the full software system at the user interaction level. So you will, um, in system level tests, you execute the code the exact same way that your users are going to execute the code. An example of this is I, when I'm not working on Trilinos, I also work on a data compression code called Tucker MPI. And we have tests that run the entire sequence of events that our, that our users would run. Our users, um, they, they use our code to read in a piece of their data, they compress the data, and then later on, they're going to reconstruct their entire data based on the compression. So what we do in the system level test is I, I run a script that, uh, that compresses some data and then reconstructs the data and determines whether the recompressed data or the reconstructed data is what it should be. There are also different types of tests. Verification tests uh, check whether the code implements the intended algorithm correctly and it checks for specific mathematical properties. So as my crew mentioned earlier, if we're solving a linear system AX equals B, it doesn't matter how big A is, if it has five distinct eigenvalues, then a Krelov solver should converge in five iterations or fewer. Verification tests can be of any granularity. So you could have a unit test that is also a verification test. You could have a system level test that's also a verification test. Acceptance tests assert acceptable functioning for a specific customer. They're different than other types of tests which don't necessarily involve the customers. And these are generally at the system level because that is the level at which your customer interacts with the code. For example, uh, you wanna see if your linear solver achieves the correct convergence rate for a particular customer's linear system. Regression tests are frequently called no change tests. They compare the current observable standard, uh, the current observable output to a gold standard. The gold standard uh, it can come from a variety of places, but it frequently comes from a previous version of the software. So it's kind of similar to a verification test, but in a verification test, you're comparing against some mathematical truth I know that this has to converge in five iterations because that's how math works. That is the property of a Krelov solver. 
But here you're comparing against some gold standard, and the gold standard doesn't necessarily have a mathematical truth behind it. Sometimes it's just, my code took uh, 10 iterations to converge last week. I want to see that it is still taking 10 iterations to converge this week. And I also want to see if it achieves the same solution. Now, again, as Mike mentioned, uh, because we're doing our experiments on floating point uh, platforms and usually with a lot of parallel computing, it's not necessarily a good idea to do um, bitwise comparisons of your numbers. You don't necessarily want to have some gold standard and make sure that your current output matches that gold standard to every single bit. Because if you're running MPI code, then your, your operations are happening in a non-deterministic non order, and you might get slightly different results. So a lot of times people use a bounded change test instead of an exact diff for floating point computations. Performance tests are different than the other ones we talked about because they have absolutely nothing to do with correctness. Instead, they focus on the runtime and resource utilization of the code. For instance, let's say I had a linear solver code that took 10 seconds to solve a particular system last week, and I want to make sure that it still takes 10 seconds or less this week. I want to make sure that it doesn't take two minutes now. I also want to make sure that it doesn't suddenly take um, five gigabytes to solve the problem instead of the 10 megabytes it was taking last week. Installation tests are frequently overlooked, but they're very important. They verify that the configure make install process is working as expected. Uh, the reason this is important is, let's say you're using CMake and CTest. So all of your tests are being built and run. Um, all of your tests are being built and run in essentially in your build directory. A user could try to do something similar in their code and fail because you accidentally forgot to copy a file from your source directory to the installation directory. So installation tests will catch those kind of errors, the errors where you forgot to copy a file to your installation directory that the user is going to need. We're gonna talk about good testing practices now. Test-driven development's a good idea. Uh, that's where acceptance tests are written before the software. This is a good idea because it helps you gain clarity on code. You know exactly what is expected of your code because the tests already exist. You know um, this is what my function should look like. These are its parameters. These are the special cases that might come into play. And it also guarantees that the tests will exist. We are all very busy people. We have, um, we have paper deadlines, we have deadlines at work, and sometimes testing kind of falls by the wayside. So it's good to have tests in advance because then you don't have to worry about writing them later, and let's face it, you never will write them later. This is especially useful when testing is viewed as an unsustainable tax on resources. You should try to provide users a regression test suite if you can. Uh, this is useful because no matter how many different platforms you test on, there will be some user who runs the code on a machine that you have never heard of, and then it doesn't work, and you have no idea why it doesn't work. Um, so if you provide them a regression test suite, then they can run the regression test suite and give you information about what exactly is failing, as opposed to just, I, I tried to do things with your code on this machine and it didn't work, and why didn't it work? You should also test software regularly, preferably daily. Um, the reason for this is, let's say you're working on Trilinos, uh, which is the software that I work on at Sandia. You learned about it earlier in the week. You're working on Trilinos, and you are touching Trilinos uh, with the other developers 12 times a day. That is the average number of commits that we get a day. We have people touching the code 12 times per day. If we don't test our code every day, let's say we test our code once a month, and we find out that there is a bug somewhere in the code, there are several hundred commits that could have possibly broken that code. If we test it daily, then we find out, oh, something broke that wasn't broken yesterday. One of these 12 commits is what broke it. You have to have a consistent policy on dealing with failed tests. This is where the issue tracking that Mike talked about earlier comes into play. Uh, you can use an issue tracker to, to determine, to make sure that everybody knows how quickly the test needs to be fixed and also who is responsible for fixing it. It's also a good idea to add a regression test afterwards to, re to avoid reintroducing the issue later, and you might be thinking at this point, why am I talking about adding a new test when we're dealing with an already failing test? Maybe uh, all of your unit tests were passing, and you have a system level test that is suddenly failing, and you don't know why, but you investigate it and you figure out why, so then you should um, insert a new regression test at the very finest level you can uh, that reproduces that same issue. 
Also, someone needs to be in charge of watching the test suite. The test suite is not useful if nobody ever monitors it. If you have tests um, starting to fail and nobody notices, then you might as well not even bother. When you refactor your code or add new features, you should run a regression suite before check-in. This helps you avoid introducing errors into your code. Um, you should also add new regression tests for the new features. You should require a code review before releasing the test suite because another person may spot issues you didn't. For instance, um, I work on a tensor code and my background in tensors is not amazing. So when I do a code review with the rest of my team, um, I'm competent with the software, but the other people are maybe more competent with mathematics and they'll say things like, Did you, are you sure that the code works for this one specific case? I didn't even think about that case. I didn't even think about how that case was different because their math background is different than mine. So code reviews are incredibly cost effective even though they end up requiring more people. It's a good idea to avoid regression suites consisting entirely of system level no change tests. And the reason I bring this up is uh, Trilinos, we have some customers that use an awful lot of system level no change tests. So if you've been uh, following what Trilinos is working on, what we work on with Trilinos at all, um, you know that we've been working on next generation platforms. So we're threading things that weren't previously threaded. We're working on porting some of our routines to GPUs. And what this means for some of our customers, the customers that are doing the system level no change tests, is whenever we add threading to a function that wasn't previously threaded, then all of a sudden, all of their tests start failing. And they assume that we've broken the code. We haven't broken the code, we just added threads to something. Our code is performing better now, but they don't realize that because their, their tests are system level no change tests and they see that um, they don't have the bitwise reproducibility anymore that they were getting out of those tests. The, the, gold, the results they're getting now are slightly different than their gold standard, so all of the tests are failing and they don't know why, uh, don't do that. Another problem with system level no change tests is that the tests often have to be rebaselined. Maybe we make a change to Trilinos and now the operations are being done in a slightly different order and they're still getting, um, they're getting one particular result on their machine now and it's slightly different than the old result they were getting. Maybe they change that and now the new result becomes the gold standard. Did they check to see whether that should be the gold standard? If you don't check to see whether that should be the gold standard, then you could potentially um, have a test that's not checking anything valid. Uh, you have a test that's just comparing numbers and the numbers aren't necessarily correct. It's also hard to maintain uh, regression suites consisting entirely of system level no change tests across multiple platforms because you can run the same code on two different machines and get different answers. So how do you uh, create a gold standard when that's the case? And as we discussed before, you can do, instead of a bitwise diff, you can do a floating point comparison. Maybe if the two numbers are within 10 to the negative four of each other, then you're good. Maybe if they're within 10 to the negative 10, you're good. But it's hard to set that tolerance and a loose tolerance can allow subtle defects to appear and your test will continue passing because you said that as long as it's within some tolerance, the test passes. So hopefully we are all now in, firmly in the tests are good camp. Are we all in the tests are good camp? Some people are abstaining from the tests are good camp. That's unfortunate. Um, as I mentioned before, tests keep people from dying, so tests are good. But motivating other people to write tests, um, the way that I was motivated when I started at Sandia, I wasn't motivated with, by the way, if you don't test your code, it could kill people. Although at, at Sandia, we do work on, we work on weapons, so, Realistically, that is a concern. Uh, the way my manager motivated me was he said, I noticed that you checked an eigensolver into the repository. I noticed that you added a new eigensolver to Trilinos without any tests whatsoever. Are you using this for your thesis? Yeah, I'm using this for my thesis. What if somebody breaks it? What if somebody touches a piece of code that your code depends on? What if somebody breaks um, the linear algebra subroutines? and then it breaks your eigensolver, and you end up um, having to redo a whole bunch of work for your dissertation because somebody else messed up your code and didn't even realize it. And that was terrifying enough to make me write tests because I didn't want to spend any more time in grad school. <laughs> My manager said, if you, if you don't write tests, you might have to spend more time in grad school. Testing is cheaper and easier than debugging. Um, oh, right, I, I forgot to mention this, but, <laughs> 
our general policy at Sandia, on the Trilinos team at least, is if you break something, then you are technically responsible for fixing it. We help each other out. We are all in the same boat of wanting Trilinos to work well. Um, but you are not singularly responsible for somebody else breaking your code, which is why it's a good idea to have tests for your code, because then it makes somebody else responsible for fixing it when they break it. Anyway, testing is cheaper and easier than debugging. You can put in a few hours now to add tests to your code, or you can put in a few weeks later when something breaks and you have no idea what broke it. And you might already have some tests lying around. Maybe you've been generating results for conferences and papers, and you have a driver that, um, that you could just maybe make a little smaller. Uh, instead of running a problem of order a billion, run a problem of order a thousand, add a, a condition to the end of what the result should be, and that's a test. You can take a user submitted bug and turn that into a test. Uh, in Trilinos, we do this very frequently. So if you look through the Trilinos repository, sometimes you'll notice that there's a test called bug 6873, or just some bug number. And that's what that's all about. Somebody submitted a bug on Bugzilla, and somebody else um, asked the user for a piece of code that would reproduce the issue. And then we took it and we inserted it in the repository as a regression test. You can also take examples that you have lying around because hopefully your code has some documentation, it has examples, it has a tutorial somewhere. You can take your examples, add a condition onto the end of it, and presumably you already know what the output should be for your code because you're using it as an example. So just add a condition to the end of it and you have a test. Verification. Code verification uses tests, but it's more than a collection of tests. It's the holistic process through which you ensure that your implementation shows the expected behavior your implementation is consistent with your model, and that the science you're trying to do can be done. We're gonna go through some examples now of DOE code verification. tPetra is part of Trilinos. It's the distributed basic linear algebra subroutines. It contains sparse matrices and dense matrices, vectors, all sorts of things. We have tests that check for correct linear algebra. Uh, if you do a matrix vector product, do you get the correct solution? If you do a dot product, do you get the correct solution? If you scale a vector, do you get what's, what you should get? But additionally, we also check for correct errors. If you give us input that is invalid, we check to make sure that the correct exception gets thrown. So for instance, if you try to uh, multiply a matrix and a vector that have inc incompatible dimensions, we have a test that makes sure that it throws the correct exception for that. Belos is the Krilov solver package. We use problems that have known solutions. Uh, a lot of the time what we'll do is we will take some matrix A We'll create a random vector y, and then we'll generate b equals a y, which ensures that b is in the range of a, and then we solve a x equals b, because we know that that's going to have a solution. Some of the tests use the Belos matrix and vector classes. What types of tests would these be? What granularity of tests would these be if they are only using Belos? Are they going to be unit tests, integration tests, or system level tests? Uh, what was that? Unit. unit tests, okay. So, yeah, that's going to be a unit test because it's only using the Belos matrix and vector classes. If we're using ePetra and tPetra classes with Belos, can I get a show of hands for that is a unit test? Can I get a show of hands for that is an integration test? Can I get a show of hands for that is a system level test? Integration, that is, that's great, you guys are amazing. Um, we use tests with the Petra and T-Petra classes as well as the Belos classes just to, um, to try to figure out what, when one of them goes wrong. We also test with and without preconditioning, both left and right preconditioning. Anasazi is the Eigen Solver package. That is my hometown. I keep touching the mic, sorry. Uh, we use problems with known solutions in Anasazi. It's a lot harder to find problems with known solutions when you're talking about eigenvalues than it is linear systems. But we use some problems that were generated using uh, MATLAB's SPRAND. And then we also use problems with analytic solutions. For instance, if you're discretizing the look-loss operator, there is the eigenvalues of that matrix are known, no matter what size you're creating. So that's one of our common test problems in Anasazi. We also measure the residual of the computed eigenvectors to make sure that they are valid and the number of iterations get compared to some gold standard. Sometimes the gold standard is just a number because uh, some eigensolvers don't have a really nice theoretical convergence rate, but for the eigensolvers that have a nice theoretical convergence rate, we use that for the gold standard. 
Super LU is a package out of Lawrence Berkeley. Is it Lawrence Berkeley? Yeah. It's a package out of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs that does sparse Gaussian illumination, and it has an amazing test suite. They have many unit and integration level tests, and the entire suite can be run in a few minutes, which is impressive considering it has several thousand tests in it. It demonstrates validation and acceptance testing and also no change or bounded change testing, and it demonstrates how to deal with floating point issues. So this is what the SuperLU test suite essentially looks like. They do a parameter suite over all sets of valid parameters, and they run the code. So they're going to exercise the code with all sets of valid parameters. And this ends up running 10,000 tests in a few minutes. Why don't we just always use the most stringent testing? Why don't we have all the tests? Why don't we have um, all of the automated tests that we could want? Sometimes the effort spent in devising tests in the testing regime are attacks on team resources, and when the tax is too high, the team can't meet code use objectives. If you, ha if you have a three-person team and one of your people is devoted to doing nothing but testing, then you're probably not going to get a whole lot of uh, code done. You're not going to get a whole lot of new features added to the code because you are using one-third of your team to do this. If the tax is too low, then the necessary oversight is not provided and defects in the code sneak through. So you wanna to try to find a balance. And we're going to talk about that balance now. Projects can have different needs based on a variety of things. Um, you might have code with different objectives. So a proof of concept code is going to be very different in terms of its testing needs than a production code. You could also have different types of teams uh, based on the number of your developers. Maybe you only have two developers in your team. Maybe you have 100 developers in your team. The developers could have different backgrounds. They could have a different geographical spread. For instance, in the Trilinos team, uh, we're scattered all throughout the country. I work in Pittsburgh. My crew works in Minnesota. We have some other people in Minnesota. We have some people in New Mexico. We have somebody in Utah. We have some people in California. So our meetings look different than a lot of people's meetings would. Projects can also be at various stage in their life cycle. Uh, if a code is expected to live longer, then you want it to be tested better than a code that, should, that would have a short lifespan. And you can also have um, different needs based on the complexity of your code. But there are some things that, are, that all of these codes would have in common. Unit testing is always good. You always wanna make sure that you have unit tests in your test suite uh, so that if, some, if a unit test fails, then you know exactly what to fix. But unit testing is not sufficient. You shouldn't have a test suite that is nothing but unit tests. You need to make sure that you have at least some system level tests too to make sure that, um, for instance, you didn't break the, the parsing of the input parameters for your user. You want to verify the expected behavior and it's important to understand the range of validity and applicability. So for various project scopes, uh, if you're doing a proof of concept code, then maybe you don't need to do a whole lot of testing, just the stuff that was on the previous slide. If you have a limited use code, then you would want to manually run the test suite before each use maybe. But the coverage is still important. You still wanna make sure that you have enough tests uh, to establish whether your code is working correctly or not. And then if you're uh, using, if you're working on a bigger project like a library or a simulation analysis code, it's going to depend on your team and the complexity of your code. But for regular simulation and analysis code, you do want system level integrated coverage. So customizing for your project needs. If your team is very small, it only has one or two developers, then maybe you just need to do manual testing and verification every so often. Because if you only have one or two developers, then realistically, how often are you even touching the code? How often does the code even change that you would need to test it all the time? If you have a mid-sized to large team, then you probably want an automated test suite running regularly. For instance, at Sandia on the Trilinos project, we have an automated test suite that runs every night. Uh, we also do some continuous tests, but predominantly we, we run overnight. For subgroups within the team, you might wanna have an automated test suite with tests of different granularity. Again, Trilinos were divided up into various um, teams based on the package that we work on. And some of the teams are kind of autonomous. The frequency of the testing depends on the life cycle stage. If you have code that isn't changing a whole lot, then maybe just do regular automated testing based on how frequently the code changes. But if you have a mid-sized large team working on the same code component doing rapid development, if people are touching the code all the time, then you're going to wanna do continuous integration maybe. 
we're going to talk now about maintaining a test suite. The test suite is, the testing regime is only useful if it's going to be maintained, monitored regularly, and if it has a rapid response to failure. Um, maintenance includes updating the tests and benchmarks. So when you add new features to the code, you want to make sure that those new features have tests coming in with them. If you remove features from the code, if you start deprecating things, then you should also update your test suite and remove the tests that uh, correspond to those features. Maintenance also includes archiving and retrieval of the test suite output, which is helpful in tracing the change in code behavior. Monitoring individual tests manually is not reasonable and it should be automated. Uh, for instance, in Trilinos, we have 1,500 tests. I can't possibly monitor all 1,500 of those tests. I should really only have to look at the failing tests, and realistically, I should only have to look at the failing tests that I have something to do with. Um, if there's a, an optimization package test that's failing, I probably shouldn't be involved in that. I don't do anything with optimization. I don't know that much about our optimization package. So the key is here that only certain developers need to be involved in looking at the failing tests. Your tests should pass most of the time, and I know this seems like common sense, but a lot of us do leave tests failing for large periods of time, and the longer you leave the test failing, the harder it is to fix that test, because you can no longer remember what it was that broke the test to begin with. It's really easy to make sure that the tests pass most of the time when the code changes are infrequent, but when the changes get to be really frequent, that's hard. Uh, this is also why the pre-commit test suites are a good idea, because if you have a pre-commit test suite and you make sure that you run it before you commit any code, then you have a much smaller chance of breaking things. There, there are still times when you can break things, like I, I don't personally run uh, CUDA on my machine, so I've broken the Trilinos CUDA build before and not realized it until the nightly test came back saying you broke the thing. Not that, not that I ever make mistakes, but theoretically if I did. Uh, you also need to periodically review the collection of tests, as I mentioned before. You look for gaps and redundancies. And this is important because you need to conserve your testing resources. For those of us that work on large parallel codes, um, you're not just running your tests on somebody's laptop. Maybe you're running tests on a big distributed machine. And you have a finite amount of time on that big distributed machine. Other people are trying to use it. And if you spend all of your time, if you spend all of those resources, running tests that don't need to be run, then that is a waste of everybody's time. It's important when you create your test suite that you aim for a quick diagnosis of error, and a mix of different granularities works well for this. Again, unit tests are good for isolating component or subcomponent level faults. Integration tests um, and system level tests are also useful. And maybe it's not as apparent why a system level test would be useful, but I have done things before like um, I had a test suite where all of my tests were passing, I had a whole bunch of unit tests, I had some integration tests, I didn't have any system level tests, and the customer reported that the code wasn't working, and the reason the code wasn't working is I broke the driver, and I never bothered to test the driver. That's where system level tests come in handy. Some rules of thumb are you want to enable quick pinpointing and you want to have good code coverage. We will talk about code coverage later this afternoon. For a large code experience with test selection, uh, please see this paper by Anshu Dubey. Anshu Dubey is sitting back there and she will be talking later this afternoon. Now we're going to talk about some examples from Alchemia, Amanzi, and Trilinos. These are different DOE codes. They focus on different team sizes and objectives and different lifetime spans. So here's a table of our codes. Alchemia has a couple of developers. I think they have three developers but the developers uh, spend so little time on Alchemia that, practically speaking, they have fewer than one uh, full-time em full employee. It doesn't have a lot of code, it's only a few thousand lines, and they only touch the code every few months or so when somebody requests a new feature. Amanzi has about a dozen developers. It's hard to tell with both Amanzi and Trulinos how many developers they actually have because we're supported by um, a lot of summer interns. So if you look at the Trilinos repository, it will tell you that something like 100 people have committed to Trilinos. That's valid, but at any given time, we, we only have a few dozen developers that are active. Amanzi has a couple, thou, couple hundred thousand lines of code, and they have a few commits every day. Trilinos is pretty big. We have a couple million lines of code, and we average about 12 commits per day. 
So what are these things? I know you talked about trilinos earlier in the week, but you might not know what Alchemia and Amanzi are. Alchemia is a biogeochemistry API and wrapper library that provides a unified interface to the existing geochemistry engines, Crunchflow and PFlowTran. It allows subsurface flow and transport simulators to access a range of functionality. I believe it's used by Amanzi. But as you probably guessed from the previous slide, it is not an implementation of a biogeochemistry reaction library. It's only a few thousand lines of code. It does not perform geochemical calculations. How does it get tested? It gets tested using continuous integration testing with Travis CI. We will have a Travis CI demo later. And this works for uh, the Alchemia team because Alchemia builds really fast. The test suite runs really fast. Travis CI has some upper limit as far as how long you, you can take to build and run things. And Travis CI also works well for them because their commits happen in short bursts. It wouldn't necessarily make sense for them to set up nightly testing because they only touch the code a couple times a year. So Travis CI, it really only gets run when somebody touches the package. Amanzi is a parallel flow and reactive transport simulator that is used to model hydrological and biogeochemical cycling in the Colorado River system. And it's also used to analyze multiple DOE waste disposal sites. What do I mean by that? Um, so back in the time when we didn't necessarily know a lot about radiation, we did some things with radioactive materials that were not good. Uh, we disposed of it improperly because nobody knew any better. And now we model those DOE waste disposal sites to see how to clean them up. Amanzi has 156 tests that can be run via C-test because they use CMake. They don't have any continuous integration yet, but they're interested in setting it up. Uh, the developers are expected to run the entire test suite before they commit, though, to make sure that they don't uh, break the code. New physics contributions are required to come with a new system level test, and they have tests of varying granularities from unit to system level. Ah, important thing to note. Remember how I said earlier that you can take examples and turn them into tests? That's where a lot of their system level tests come from. They just use their example codes and they insert a condition on the end of it to see whether it passed or failed. Trilinos, as I'm sure you already discussed, is a collection of libraries intended to be used as building blocks for the development of scientific applications. It's organized into 66 packages and it has functionalities like linear solvers, nonlinear solvers, eigen solvers, preconditioners, and many more things. We have 1,500 tests, about 1,500 tests in Trilinos between the 66 packages. And like the Amanzi team, we are strongly encouraged to run a check and test script when we commit any code. We also have automated testing on a variety of different platforms. Um, both of these things are important because, as I mentioned before, I can run the test suite and it will pass on my machine, and then I commit it, and somebody else runs it on a CUDA build, and it fails because I used a functor and CUDA doesn't like it. Our check and test script is pretty smart. It detects which packages were modified by your commits. So if I touch on a SOSI, which is the package I touch, it's Eigen Solvers. If I touch on a SOSI, it will determine um, that I touched that package, and then it will also see which packages I could have potentially broken. So by touching on a SOSI, the Eigen Solver package, I could have broken on a SOSI itself, but I could have also potentially broken uh, the graph partitioning package Zoltan, because Zoltan depends on on a SOSI. And then anything that's going to depend on Zoltan, I could have also potentially broken. So it builds up this tree of, thing, of things that I could have potentially broke. Uh, that's if I touch Anasazi. If I touch a, Anasazi is a pretty high level package. If I touch a lower level package like T Petra or E Petra, then a lot of things depend on those. If I were to touch T Petra, I can break T Petra. I can break the iterative solvers in Belos. I can break the Eigen solvers in Anasazi, and then Zoltan, and I could break most of Trilinos by touching T Petra. So the commit script, the check and test script will determine if you touched T Petra, you could have broken all of these things, and then it will run the tests corresponding to all of the things you could have broken. So after it configures, builds, and tests those packages, if everything succeeded, it pushes to the repository, and if it failed, it reports why it failed. So if it failed during the build step, it will say, I failed during the build, here was the build error that I got. If it failed during the testing stage, it will tell you, I failed during testing, here's the test that failed. The check and test script is useful for ensuring that your changes don't break another package. Um, it's especially useful for me because I don't know a whole lot about Zoltan. It would be very, very easy for me to break Zoltan without noticing, but by running the check and test script, I am alerted to that early and I don't push the code until everything's clean. <laughs> 
based on the packages that you touch, it might take a while to run the check and test script, but a lot of people run it overnight, so it's not an impediment to our workflow. Why do we do automated testing if everybody uses the check and test script? I've said this over and over again, but uh, it might test a different set of packages, and it could also test different environments. I never use the Intel compilers because I just don't have the Intel compilers on my machine. So it'll check whether my changes worked with the Intel compilers as well as GNU, and sometimes they don't. It'll check whether my changes worked on a Mac. I don't own a Mac, I don't use any Macs, so I have no idea when I break things on the Mac. And it also checks whether your changes work with CUDA and various other configurations that um, you don't necessarily have on your personal machine. The automated testing is also nice because it identifies a small set of commits that could have broken a build or test. Um, we run nightly testing, so we know every time we run the tests, if a test starts failing, that it, it fails because of one of these 12 tests, or one of these 12 check-ins. So by identifying the small set of commits that could have broken it, it identifies the person who knows how to unbreak it, which is our, our real goal. We want to identify who it is that can fix the thing. Bugs are also easier to catch, to fix if they're caught early. If you told me today that I broke something yesterday, I could probably fix it. Um, if you told me in a year that I broke something on August 8th, 2017, I would have no idea what you were talking about. I wouldn't even begin to be able to, to fix the bug. What if bad people don't use the check-in test script? Well, they're not necessarily bad people, but they're better people if they do use the check-in test script. That's all I'm saying. Uh, if somebody doesn't use the check-in test script, then their commit does not include the check-in script information. I've pointed out a good developer here. This is Mark. Mark, um, he gave us a good commit message, and we've already identified earlier that good commit messages are important. He specifies in his commit message what he's fixing. He's fixing bugs 438 and 558. And then below that, we see the message that the check-in test script has automatically appended. And it gives us a lot of information here. So this uh, says that the enabled packages were tpetra core, and he disabled some, some other ones because Mark just chooses not to run FEI, PyTrilinos, STK, et cetera. Uh, but it gives us even more information below that. It says that 100 tests passed in MPI debug and 74 tests passed in serial release. Um, there should have been more tests than that for tpetra. When you touch tpetra, you could break most of Trilinos. So what this says is that Mark presumably disabled forward packages. Um, he only tested the, he only executed the tpetra tests. So if something broke in tpetra, this commit would be a moderately unlikely candidate for having broken it. If something breaks in an upstream package, if something breaks in a package that uses tpetra, then yeah, this would be a reasonable candidate for having been, having been the commit that broke it. We're going to look at the Trilinos automated testing dashboard now. So this is the Trilinos testing dashboard. And I'm sorry, the, the resolution has kind of pushed all of the useful information into about two square inches. But this is what our testing dashboard looks like. We see here that in the Trilinos project, we have um, 500 and some builds that have happened today. Uh, most of the configures passed, some of them had warnings. Most of the builds passed, some had warnings. Three of them didn't build at all. And I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that um, some of the Trilinos builds have a flag that, um, that recognizes warnings as errors. So sometimes, sometimes that's where that comes into play. We also have four failing tests in Trilinos right now. And if we scroll down, we can see where those four failing tests are. They're organized by package. So there is one failing test in Anasazi, the eigensolver package. And there are three in Amosos 2. If I click in Amosos 2, then I can get more information about that. It's loading. There we go. The first thing that it says is these are the subproject dependencies of Amosos 2. Amosos 2 depends on Tefos. Most of the packages in Trilinos depend on Tefos. It defines pointers things like that. It depends on ePetra, triutils, tpetra, all of these things. And if we saw, none of the tests are failing in these packages right now. 
But if we saw that one of these packages had a whole bunch of tests suddenly failing, then maybe that would be why we had three failing tests in Amosos 2. Somebody maybe broke something in ePetra, and then that broke Amosos 2. But it doesn't look like that's the case today. If we scroll down further, much further, it's hard to navigate at this uh, zoomed in so far, sorry. <laughs> to find my three failing tests. Ah, there we go. If I click here, where we have the three failing tests, it'll give me more information about those three failing tests. So here we see the information about the build, um, what, what computer was it run on, what's the OS, et cetera. And if we scroll down, we can see which tests were the ones that failed. I'm not an Amosos 2 developer, so these test names don't mean a lot to me, but to the Amosos 2 developers, they could probably look at these and tell what it was that, that broke these tests. In addition to the project dashboard, if you might be the person that broke something, you will get an email about it because not all of us monitor the, dash, the, the dashboard every day. Um, I personally don't monitor the dashboard every day. So if you break something, you get an email about it saying, you checked in a commit during these times when a person might have broken the repository. Please take a look at this thing. We're trying to move towards a new master develop workflow to make sure that our master branch remains stable because we have important customers that need the code to be working at all times. Um, all of our developer changes are now pushed to a develop branch. We don't personally touch master ever anymore. I don't have permission to touch master, which you know, is smart because we've established I make mistakes a lot. Um, all of the developer changes are pushed to the develop branch, and if the changes are deemed to be okay, then we merge from develop to master. This is currently a manual process for the Trilinos framework team, but because we don't hate them, we are eventually going to make this an automated process. Uh, right now, we have this guy, Brent, who is our MVP, and he checks the dashboard every day. If there are new, new tests failing, then he merges. An important consideration about Trilinos, we mentioned uh, Travis CI earlier. Travis CI might not be the greatest um, fit for this particular project because commits are very frequent to Trilinos, and the test suite is really big. It takes a while to build and run the tests. So it might be impractical to run the test suite after each commit through Travis CI. But for other projects, Travis CI is great, just maybe not for this particular project. So to summarize, software testing is very important. Uh, there are all kinds of different types of tests, and different projects will have different needs, as we discussed. We're going to resume our talk of software testing after the break. Uh, we'll talk about code coverage and continuous integration testing. And by talk about that, I mean we will have a hands-on session, so come back ready to, to actually do things. Uh, what do you use to have unit tests run with high level languages to uh, interact with low level functions and classes in, in the software? Uh, can you rephrase that? Do you use any tools uh, in particular for uh, calling or designing unit testing, the lowest level ones? Oh, no, I, I don't use any special tools for that. Um, although I do use code coverage tools to make sure that the unit tests are being written for all of the functions to make sure that I, I didn't leave any untested. So was your question related to what she specifically uses or did you just want to know a few of them? Um, so, I mean, there's a, um, for Fortran, for example, there is PF unit for, uh, C++, there is Google test, is there, yeah. So, in, because I program most often in Fortran, I know that one, this PF unit. But yes, there are such um, testing harnesses available that if you search for them, you will find them. Thank you. <laughs>